Today I'm going to talk about grids. Uh, and all this week is really dedicated to grid, grids. There's going to be uh, the use of them and ways to use them as a creative tool and also as a tool for assuring accuracy. And there will be a talk about, uh, that will sort of uh, uh, hammer in on that about, about the right ways and wrong ways to use a grid. And uh, then I will do a demonstration how to turn your typographical decisions into a functional grid if you have not been working that way from the beginning. And probably for someone experienced, uh, this would be an unnecessary step, but I would guess for a lot of you, because I've seen it before, is probably a necessary step because it uh, is some things in InDesign that uh, you don't know how to use, do yet. Um, so this is about as simple as a grid there are for a magazine or really any uh, roughly eight and a half by 11 publication. Uh, is a two column grid and uh, and you would never go with a single column on a page and the reason for that is the type is just too small and the line gets too long and people would lose track of that line as they tried to read across an entire page uh, if i wanted to go across the entire page and i have sometimes i would usually and i would always in that case make my type bigger and i would probably make it much shorter and i'll show you an example of this sort of design as we get a little bit further into this uh, uh, lecture. But the two-column grid is, is simple, uh, it's boring, uh, but it's very clean. Um, we have this basic two columns, and even though the text is on a regular grid, and that's a point I try to hammer home again and again, is the grid is really just for your running text, whether it's your sans or your sans serif, or your, um, maybe in this case, captions. Um, some designs would allow captions to go off the grid, but other things can go off the grid or outside the margins, like this photo is going to the uh, fold. Uh, this photo is bleeding off of the page, both top and bottom. This uh, photo is bleeding off of the page at the top, and this one is actually on grid. So it's simple, but it's very kind of a pleasing spread. There are all these photographs that are combining to tell a visual story about this glass studio. And, uh, and I mean, it, it's pleasing. It's really simple, but it's pleasing. There's just absolutely nothing wrong with it. And it's also very clean. So let's, oh, that's the page I wanted. Let's uh, take a look at what we're talking about with the margins. The margins in the grid really are what apply to your little text, uh, your text that is small. And so I don't have a gutter here, but that gutter is possibly part of this grid. Well, it's certainly part of this grid, but we have these margins. It's identical on both sides. Uh, we have, and we could see that this grid is mirrored. Uh, there's a little bit more white space at the top. Um, looks like about the same amount of white space on the inside and the outside. And space at the bottom that includes room for the folio. And when we get into our demonstration of creating your own grids, I will talk also about how to create your own folio so you can have automatic page numbering. The other thing that's off the grid is this credit. Because this, these margins, they're not, they're a tool. They're not, uh, they're not a law that you can't go beyond them, but they're just a tool to allow you to quickly and accurately place the text of your articles. That's what they're there for. Um, I would say they do not trump the eye if your eye tells you it's not quite right, uh, but it's something to be aware of and it's a useful thing to have to make sure your pages are repeatable and consistent and branded and and uh, have the same basic feel as each other. Uh, now here's what happens when a grid goes slightly awry. Um, I think this is a fairly, I mean, you know, this is also a simple spread. Um, it's full color printed, just like that one is. This red up here in the corner is a build of a few colors. There's an orange down here, uh, but it's not using color to particularly good advantage. Uh, and it is, probably even more text heavy than the other page. And this page just looks for a couple, this spread rather, just looks for a couple of reasons, just kind of broken. And the reason it feels broken is because it, you know, frankly is. Um, so if you look at this little sidebar down here, 
you can see it's actually falling off the grid. It's almost being trimmed off the page. It's going below uh, the folio line, the American Prospect line on, on that page. And also, I would describe this in this corner as a broken area as well. I mean, this text is not aligning with the text on the other page. It's just sort of starting haphazardly down the page. And that would be fine if the spread was otherwise using white space, if white space was incorporated into the design, and if white space was balanced across this design. But in this case, it's just a little bit of random emptiness in there. Now, there are other things. This happens to be a conservative, that, uh, a conservative magazine, uh, and um, I think uh, it's a better designed one now, as I recall. It's still not particularly well designed. Uh, and other things I would say that sort of add up to bad design here is a lack of hierarchy. All these stories just have the same sort of value. You know that this one's first because it runs as long as it runs and then you get into the next one. I would say that this is an unfortunate uh, type combination, that kind of severe sans with this scripty S. Um, I don't know the thinking behind why you would combine those two types of faces. And I also don't think that once you have a section name, and I've talked about signage before in this class, this is the signage for this section. The section is called Scan, and this is the logo or the branding for this section. But I don't think once you establish it on a spread, you need it a second time. And then with the second time, it's just treated so differently. It's smaller than this S really should be. Um, and uh, it's put in this oval. And so I don't know why there are these two very tr different treatments for this logo. And I'm uh, with my magazine, I'm a little bit in a uh, uh, glass house there, but uh, uh, for other reasons. But this is because of the design I inherited. But this is... Uh, I would say an example of a, of a spread that A is a little bit broken because it's falling off the grid. It would just be so simple to make this line up. It would be so simple to disentangle the art from the logo. This is all kind of clustered in, a, in an unpleasing little bunch. Uh, but that was not done in this case. So that was a three column grid. I think everyone can see that. We can count the columns on one page, one, two, three, and on the other page, one, two, three. We can see that's a three column grid. Uh, grid. But there are other ways to think about grids, even relatively simple ones like three column grids. And one way you could think about your columns is as units. So this is the same column grid as that one. Uh, the, I mean, the, the actual proportions may be a little bit different. The page size may be a little bit different, but it's a basic three column grid. But in this case, we have uh, one story that is spanning two of those columns plus a little bit of gutter in between and uh, it is you thinking of those columns as units and that can be a really useful way to think about grids especially as you get into more complex ones and I don't want to dwell on this space this page too much because it was talked about in a different lecture but this is a basic one column story and uh, we have this nice white space here, the way the news lines up with those two columns. I don't love that little statue guy coming in. That seems like just a distraction. Uh, but otherwise, we have this nice uh, balance of white space that is following this grid. So it's a fairly open feeling page, even though it has a fair amount of information. And what I was talking about earlier, if you want to go uh, uh, across a wider span and two columns for text this small. And this is probably, I, at my publication, this would not be body copy. This would be something probably called the fine print or transitions text or something like that. It would probably be specialized. Uh, and this is probably a deviation from their regular body, but it's a very short story and they go a little bit big, a little bit airier, a little bit more open. So one of the things that always happens in this class is everyone feels a little bit uh, uh, pleased in terms of their body copy. And uh, body copy should always be, you know, your body copy. It is what it is what it is and you should not deviate. Uh, 
unless you have a design reason to do it. And this is a very clear design reason to deviate from, from the small text uh, because this story is short, it's bigger, it's, uh, it's impact, it's the opening story on this page. So there are design reasons. But if you're treating your body text like uh, bubble gum and just making it a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, uh, letting it out a little bit more, letting it out a little bit less to fit the circumstances of whatever you're trying to fit in the space you're trying to fit it, uh, then you will really have no body copy at all. Um, and so that's just something else to think about as we talk about grids and body text overall. And, uh, but this is not one of those cases. This is a case where there is a clear reason to, to deviate from that body text to make an impact. Now, some columns, some grids are more complex, and I'm going to talk about two of those. Uh, and this is the first one. And to... Uh, at first look, this might look like what's called a three-column grid, and uh, it is actually probably what is a seven-column grid, and in fact, I know for a fact it is, and again, it comes down to thinking about columns as units. So if this was actually seven skinny columns, and this one is a little bit smaller, this is probably what it, my publication would be called the fine print, something that you would used for special purposes, um, and that's fine as long as you do something like that consistently and, and intentionally. Uh, this is one of those units, and so this is one, and then two of those units makes this column, and two of those units make that column, and two of those units make that one. So if we count them all together, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, we have a seven column grid. And seven column grids are often uses, used for sections like the first one we are working on, the front section. In fact, this we could see is called front to end. And the grid probably extends up to here, down to there. This bracket is not part of the grid. It's in the margin. Uh, and uh, the logo is not part of the grid. It's in the margin because the grid is a tool for quickly placing the pages as you're building them. It's not really for the architecture or the signage of the page. And in this case, the story is aligned with the top of that. Um, seems a reasonable decision. And you can see that the grid is enforced in other ways. So, for example, this little inset uh, book that, they, that this is a short review of is one of those units. And this is also likely enforcing those units. This is probably two, two, and three is what I would guess there. And all of that, because it's on this regular grid, even though things are differently sized, it's, you'll still have the flexibility of a seven column grid, but they are uh, uh, still you know, pleasing together because they are based on the same measurement. And that is true not of just this page, but page after page after page in this magazine. And uh, uh, this was called Inside Shortly Lived Media Magazine, and it was art directed by Robert Newman, uh, who is uh, at this old house these days. He's still around. So the most flexible grid of all and the most common magazine grid is this one. And this is a little bit, when I teach this class in person, I go up to the screen or where it's projected and I hold my fingers up to this column and, uh, and then I drag my hand over to this one. And if I were to do that, you would see that this column is wider, widest. This one is a little bit less wide and this one is still less wide. And so it feels like really random decisions. But in fact, this is a 12 column grid. And if we do this little schematic of the page that I made a bunch of years ago, you can see how it works. It is again, thinking about these columns as units, not necessarily literal columns. We have one, two, three, four, five, and then we have four, and then we have three. And five plus four plus three equals 12. So it's a really unusual version of, of this grid, a really unusual way to use this grid, uh, but also pretty effective one. And you can see that those decisions in this one, like the, uh, like the last one, the decisions are being enforced by other typographical decisions. So like the ones or the big numbers uh, in the week by week are taking up that grid. This little block in the corner is taking up one of those units. And that matters here, but it also matters here because these are flowing around that and this is taking up 
uh, a bunch of those units. Uh, but it adds up to a very organized, very orderly, and also very flexible page. And at this point, I'd like to say that the 12 column is the most common grid used in magazine design. Uh, it's used by people who don't know they're using it. But if you think about columns as units and you think about the ways you can divide up a 12 column grid, well, a three column grid is derived from a 12 column because four plus four plus four equals three. And a four column grid is derived from a 12 column because three plus three plus three plus three equals 12. And a two column grid is derived from a 12 because six plus six equals 12. You know, however many of these you want to span, uh, you can span and you can get that grid. Now in practicality, I often use 12s for designing feature openers where I wanna do something fancy or I wanna balance white space out with dense areas. Um, but the nice thing about InDesign is it lets you go back and forth. You can start on a 3, switch to a 12, uh, switch back to a 3, which is a little bit faster and easier for production. But those are just part of the ways you can use 12. And by the way, your magazine can have multiple grids. Uh, a lot of magazines might use something like a, uh, a 7 in the front of the book for the pages with lots of items on them, and then switch to something like a... Uh, a three or a two or even go back and forth between the two or a seven but use that extra column as a wing in in the features the long story section so a couple more quick pages before we call this lecture done this is kind of a simple page but i think nice uh oop, we went too far uh I think it's always nice, it's always more engaging to have a picture or text interaction like this where the text is wrapping around uh, uh, the, the vehicle and uh, uh, it's nice when you have a couple of other things. This would be another example, uh, hearkening back to the briefs lecture of a branded feature. This always appeared within the briefing section um, and uh, this looks like a more complex grid, but it really isn't. It is also really a 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And in this case, and a 12 column can be great for density, like that Esquire page we just looked at, but it also can be a nice way to incorporate white space into your design. So in this case, a unit of that 12 column grid uh, is incorporated into a uh, into, uh, used as space to create a little bit of an extra buffer between these two stories, which is kind of a nice touch. Now, uh, there is one thing that seems a little bit like cheating on this grid, and I'll just point that out, which is that if you look at these two columns, they actually have a gutter in between them. And so if we actually wanted uh, that many columns, we could have this on a regular grid, uh, with a 24 column grid, we could just double it and one of those lines would hit right smack in the middle there because 12 doubled is, is 24. Uh, but uh, I would guess that this was in fact probably built on a 12 column and whoever created this just drew a uh, single text frame and divided it, broke it into two columns. You can have text, uh, uh, you can make multiple column text frames in InDesign. I sometimes work that way, I sometimes don't, depending on my mood or depending on the project. Uh, and I would guess that that's what happened here. Uh, newspaper designers have a old-fashioned term for doing that when you, uh, when you have a slightly different column structure than on your, your main grid. They call that a bastard measure. Uh, as far as I know, that term never caught on in magazine circles. And then finally, one last page. And this one is very different than the Esquire page. If you want to rewind and look at it, you can, but you'll see that they're just very, very different sorts of approaches to design in that that one had a lot of different things, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of pictures. This is one picture, one story, and a lot of white space. And there's this nice balance of white space across the spread. And I have nothing against white space. Um, 
Uh, I think it takes a while to learn how to use it effectively, uh, but it can be used effectively in a lot of cases. Uh, this is, a, I think, a no longer with us magazine called Black Book, and their front of the book, and you can see the signage here, is smell, and that was the theme of their front of the book, as they just went through the senses, you know, smell, touch, taste, and they had a little story on each. But if we look at this, it is also a 12 column grid and I won't count these, but if you want to pause the video and count them, you can. And you can see that the grid is also being enforced in subtle things like the way the curve is being picked up and sort of consuming more or less, not exactly, but pretty close to two units of that grid is also one of the ways this grid is being picked up on. And you can see the part of the image that's wrapping with the curve is exactly one unit of that grid. So that provides a nice symmetry along with the, uh, along with the white space that's balanced across the page. So feel free to have multiple grids. In fact, you're gonna be required to have multiple grids. You're, uh, in, I mean, I guess exceptions can be made with reason, but my assumption is you'll have at least two grids, one of which has extra space at the top for the signage for your brief section. 